reading, which is from 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you're using the Bibles on the seats, that's page 277. 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading continues on from the first, um, first Samuel chapter 8, and you can find it on page 278, taking it from verse 10. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone, go back to your own town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you use these words this evening, this passage that you inspired to save us from our foolish choices and to purify our hearts that we might be ready to do your will. Amen. Please do be seated. I do turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8, page 277. If, if you're feeling a, a, be, a bit of a weird mood one evening, um, and you would like a, a bizarre um, experience, then watch um, a music video by Radioactive Chicken Heads performing um, I Looked Into The Mirror. Here's some of the lyrics. I looked into the mirror. What did the mirror say? 
you're the ugliest kid I've seen. Will you please go away? My feelings had been hurt. I was really crushed. I'd combed my hair, washed my clothes. My teeth had all been brushed. I took my father's brand new coat and my brother's blue bow tie. I came back to the mirror to get a new reply. Mirror, mirror on the wall, how do I look? Just like that ugly kid, the mirror said as I withdrew. I couldn't fool that mirror, no matter how hard I tried. So there you go, you'll all be going home to listen to that. Watch the video, no doubt. <clears throat> Sometimes a mirror speaks to us and we just don't like what we hear. And 1 Samuel chapter 8 is a mirror just like that. It shows us the ugliness uh, of Israel's heart, their attitude towards um, God in the days of Samuel, but it also reveals the ugliness of our own hearts. It's a, a mirror that's held up to Israel that they always have to face, and also a mirror that reveals things uh, about us. Children often um, get hooked on certain jokes, and my children um, loved one joke. They used to come and say, Dad, do you want to see something ugly? And I'd say yes, and then they'd hand me a mirror. I'm sure you've probably had that joke played on you. And they do it time and time again, and you obviously have to give way and say yes. And 1 Samuel 8 does that to the people of God. I guess in the canon of Scripture, if Israel, someone went to Israel and said, you want to see something ugly, then they pull out 1 Samuel chapter 8. But it does the same for us as well as the people of God and for um, the church. And the first thing that this passage teaches us is that the people of God, we, make some really dumb decisions, verses 1 to 3. Now think about what, you've, what we've seen so far in 1 Samuel. Um, Eli's son were appointed leaders, and they were a complete disaster area. Uh, and now in chapter 8, Samuel's sons have been appointed as leaders, and we read in verse 3, they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and preferred, preferred to justice. Now, you would think that the leadership in Israel at this point would have lodged in their minds an alarm bells about people's sons, wouldn't you? <laughs> and they just think to themselves, well, the last thing we really need is any system where you will pass on automatically the leadership to the sons because we've had two complete and utter disaster areas in Eli's sons and Samuel's sons. But it's precisely into this situation that Samuel tells us that the people cry out for hereditary kingship. I guess the eldership were made up of dumb, dumber, and dumber still. That's who they had running Israel at this um, time. Can you imagine them walking down the street and saying, <clears throat> chatting to one of the guys, this situation that we're working with is absolutely hopeless. We're getting some real duffers of sons, aren't we? Uh, just think of Hophni and, and Phinehas, Eli's sons, and, uh, and now we've got Joel and Abijah, Samuel's son. It's absolute disaster area. Oh, I know. And the one who turns around and says, oh, I've got a great idea. An absolute corker, a belter. What is it? Kingship. What does that involve? Oh, that involves that the leadership is automatically handed over to the eldest son of the current king. Belter will go for that. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. And yet, it was perfectly reasonable in their mind. Their request <clears throat> seemed to them the best thing given their current situation. Just view it from their eyes for a moment. Samuel, verse 1, is old. Their leader is going to die. So they've got the fear of the unknown. His sons are corrupt. Their leadership is diabolical. So they're frustrated with this unwanted leadership. Danger surrounds them. We'll find that out in chapter um, 12. They're in a dire situation. They're frightened about the unthinkable. So there you have it. Fear of the unknown, frustrated with the unwanted, frightened of the unthinkable. And that's what makes these leaders, the leadership in Israel, Come to Samuel. See, their request for a king seemed perfectly rational, perfectly reasonable. <clears throat> However, Yahweh, the Lord, saw it as a rejection of his kingship. 
If we remember some of the lessons we've been taught in 1 Samuel already, we would know that the elders should have awaited a word from the Lord by His prophet. But as so often happened in those days and in our days, the people come to the prophet not to listen to him, but to dictate terms to him. You see, it was a dumb decision, a dumb decision that day, sidelining God's word in favor of worldly wisdom. That's what happened, sidelined God's word in favor of worldly wisdom wisdom. <clears throat> and how did it creep in? Uh, how, did it, how did they justify it? Well, here's what's going on in their heads. And just think about this, because you hear these things all the time. Whenever we sideline God's Word in favor of worldly wisdom, they said, well, our request is completely reasonable, clearly logical, obviously plausible, and yet utterly godless. They ticked all the right boxes in their mind, as the best way to deal with this situation, verses 1 to 3. But it was a dumb decision. A dumb decision. The dumbest thing that happened that day was the people took their lead, not from the Lord, but from the nations. They took their lead from the world. And that's when this mirror starts to reflect the church, doesn't it? So it starts getting uncomfortable. See, when the church leaders don't sit with God's Word in their hands, but they sit with newspapers and statistics and popular um, opinion and worldly agendas. Do you know what's happening? They're being dumb. (laughs) As dumb as a mule. As thick as two short planks. You see, when the church or individual Christians come to the Word of God to say to the Word of God, the nations are doing this. And it seems to be working out well for them. So why don't we give it a try? Well, when we do that, we're acting like first-rate idiots. You see, to conclude that the world can somehow um, instruct the church is to have the worst case ever of the tail wagging the dog. But that's what happened that day. They came... And they said, let's be like the nations. See, that's what makes the decision a really dumb decision because they want to be just like everyone else, verses 4 and 5. We don't like to be different, not for God's sake. We don't like to be distinct, not for God's sake. Oh, we'll be distinct for other reasons. But we don't like to stand out. Rather, we'd like to blend in with the rest of society. Like all the nations. That wasn't an expression for Israel. That became their driving passion. That's what ruled them. We want to be like the nations. Let's have a king. We'll we'll fit in. We'll belong. We'll be able to relate to the other nations better because we'll be like them on some level playing field. We'll be up to speed Relevant. God, you want us to be a light to the Gentiles. Well, if we're more like the Gentiles, then we'll be able to speak it to them, won't they? We Give us a king. They all have kings. We'll have a good platform for discussion. But Israel wasn't like all the other nations. She'd been taken from the nations to be God's treasured possession, to be a holy people, a royal priesthood. She had experienced God's blessing. She had heard God's voice. She had received God's commands. She had seen God crush the enemy. See, Israel could not escape being different. But she tried. And the church cannot escape being different. But we try. See, where we, Christian people, are under a command to be different. We've been plucked out in order to stand out, to be holy as God is holy. But like Israel, we rather than keep in step with God, we prefer to keep in step with our culture, to fit its molds and its agendas and its standards. 
But if you're in step with a corrupt culture, you are out of step with Christ. And if you're in step with the Spirit of God, then you're out of step with a sinful society. That's how it works. We were plucked out to stand out. When I think of Christians trying to blend in, this picture um, comes um, to mind. I've entitled it, The Fox and the Hounds. That fox is trying to blend in, but soon it's going to be missing an ear. It's going to have a huge chunk out of one of its legs. It's going to be severely hemorrhaging blood until eventually its life is completely drained out of its body. And when the church, and this was the case for Israel, when we seek to blend in with society, we have chunks taken out of us. The life starts hemorrhaging from our body until eventually there is no life left within us. And then how does the church present a life-giving message if there is no life in the church? We can't. Let me tell you something, categorically. If you try to blend in, you get blended. Okay? If you try to blend in, you get blended. You get chopped up, shredded, until you're just a mush of Christian thinking and Christian living. Blending, blended. You see, now I know it's hard to stand out in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. I understand that. I experience that. And so why should the church or Christians individually have a different definition of success? Why should Christians have a different moral standard? Why should Christians have different viewing habits? Why should Christian conversation be very different to those around them? Because we're different. Because we've been plucked out to stand out because we've been called to be a holy people. See, one of the lessons, one of the vital lessons that we have to learn as Christians is to have a wholesome disregard for other people's ways. They wanted to be like the nations around them, and it's a cancer in any believer we have to have a wholesome disregard for the ways of other people. We're not like them. We shouldn't pine after what unbelievers have. We shouldn't want to be like them. You're different. And what you've got to do is embrace it, love it, live it. That's the call of Christ upon our lives. So, we, as God's people, make some really dumb decisions. We make those dumb decisions because we want to be just like everyone else. And when we start acting and desiring just to be like everyone else, we act as if we don't belong to the gracious Lord, verses 6 to 9. See, when all that happens, we start to believe that these other things can deliver us and bless us more than the Lord. This king that they asked for wasn't merely a substitute for Samuel. The Lord said, that it was a substitute for him. Look at verse 7. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, it shed some light on what went wrong with this request. Let me just give you a quick run through of um, some of those verses. It, there, Samuel accuses um, Israel and he rehearses what the Lord has done for them, his saving deeds when Israel was in distress. He says, when you were in distress in Egypt, in slavery, you cried out and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron as deliverers. But you forgot me, and you, so I subjected you to various oppressors in the time of the judges. And so you cried out to the Lord, confessing your sins and pleading for deliverance. And so the Lord sent Jeroboam to deliver you. Then Israel sees Nahash, the Ammonite, 
flexing his military muscles. And you would think that they would cry out to the Lord for deliverance, but they say, no, a king must reign over us. And Samuel replies, but Yahweh, your God, is king. In this current emergency, in this dire situation that they found themselves, there's no crying out to God for deliverance, just a demand for a king. A clear but subtle substitution has taken place. Their help is not in the strong arm of the Lord, but in this new government, a new system, a new setup. And they say, and this setup, that will bring us blessing. This king will bring us security. This king will bring us victory. And it's absolutely laughable. And do you know why it's laughable? Because chapter 8 comes after chapters 5, 6, and 7. And God's box, the ark, has gone from town to town without one Israelite defeating the Philistines. And they say, give us a king who can fight for us. Well, the Lord, through a box, <laughs> has defeated the Philistines. But we always look to other things to bless. Always look to other things for security. Always look to other things for victory. And that's substitution. That is exchanging God for other gods. And here this mirror, again, is held up to our faces, showing that the people of God just always seem to have a tendency to prescribe to God rather than rely on God. A tendency to prescribe to God rather than rely on God. It's not that they said to God, Lord, we don't need your help. It's just they said, Lord, your help must take this shape, this form. You've got to do it this way. And when we prescribe the method... Do you know what that means? It means we trust more in the method than in God. Do you get that? We absolutely need to get this. If we prescribe the method, we trust more in the method than in God. And with this in mind, God knew exactly how to answer <clears throat> the elders. Do you know how he answered them? By agreeing to their request. God frequently responds to the rebellion of his people, demanding for substitutions by allowing them to be subject and experience worldly, unbelieving rule that will start to dominate their life. This is not because God is somehow thwarted by the elder's stubbornness or that somehow God is at his wit's end and he thinks, oh, forget it, they can have a king. Rather, God intends this humbling lesson for his people to result in future repentance and restoration. Sometimes, let me tell you, it's all throughout the history of Israel, sometimes God will give in to your dumb requests to show you how dumb they are and to show you how dumb you are. Do you understand that? That's what he does to us because he loves us. But sometimes his greatest judgment is giving us our own requests. So the, we make, as God's people, we make dumb um, decisions. We do this because we want to be like everyone else. And when we want to be like everyone else, we forget that we belong to the gracious God. And then we end up submitting ourselves to takers rather than the giver. Verses 10 to 18. Samuel's summary uh, of the king's way is simple. He will take, he will take. It occurs so many times, doesn't it, in those verses. But then, you've got to look at the emphasis he places on the direct objects of the verb in order to see. He's going to show them how um, many precious possessions a king will demand for himself. It's as if Samuel says, look, think of your sons. Think of them. The king will draft them as charioteers, as horsemen, as commanders and farmers and laborers. And then he really just sort of plucks on the heartstrings. He says, well, if that's not enough, think of your daughters. Um, your daughters will become um, perfume makers, cooks and bakers. And if that doesn't move you enough because you're not moved by your children, he says, think of your property. Do you think that will be secure? No, your finest fields will go 
to the king and his favored people. No, he will take, take, take. He will take your things to enhance his things. And there's a word for this. It's called slavery. You'll start having flashbacks of a life that your ancestors once had in Egypt when they were under Pharaoh. You'll have nightmares and day terrors about oppression. And I've rescued you from oppression, and now you're going to choose oppression because you're going to substitute me for a king who will take, take, take. But that's what God's substitutes do. Idols, idolatry, that's what the Bible calls it. They take rather than give. And they take and take, and we give and give until we're in servitude without realizing it, and somehow kind of quite happy with it. What is an idol? It's anything that is more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs, absorbs your hearts and imaginations more than God. Anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you. That could be money, it could be job, it could be success, it could be an education, it could be a relationship, it could be family, it could be any number of things. Almost always a, a good thing that we make an ultimate thing. But idols make a dodgy used car salesman look like an honest, honest dealer in comparison. If I was really good uh, with PowerPoint, I was going to try and put Richard Hawes' face uh, into that guy. <laughs> See, idols promise you that <clears throat> you're going to get an excellent deal at a knockdown price. Or we'll deliver the goods for far less than what others are offering you. They say, oh, the idols say, we're going to deliver blessing to your life. This relationship, this job, this success, this status will deliver ble um, blessing to you for minimal monthly payments. Oh, it's a special deal. You'll drive away a bargain and have a beautiful life. And then you sign up and you're locked in and the hidden costs come and they rock it and the benefits diminish and it's slavery, servitude. The reality is that idols quickly gain control over us and we become slaves to them. One Samuel 8 is showing the high cost of what they asked for when they rejected the Lord in favor of the king, when they replaced him and substituted him. If you read those verses 10 through to 18, it's saying, here's the cost. It's high. See, let's remember what the Bible teaches about the economics of idolatry. The price is always too high, and the ride is always too short. So why sign up? And why sign up when we've been so adequately warned? Isn't that the sad thing? Let me run through it again. See the flow of the narrative. We make some really dumb decisions of the people of God. We make those dumb decisions because we want to be just like everybody else, the nations around us. When we just want to be like everybody else, we forget that we belong to the gracious God. When we forget that we belong to the gracious God, then we hand it over to takers rather than the giver, and we do all this while we're adequately warned. While we sit in seats and in pews in front of faithful preachers who are telling us the consequences week on week, and yet we say, give us a king. We do all this with our eyes wide open. You see, after that relentless taking portfolio of the king, they've got to change their minds, haven't they? They're not going to sign up for it now, knowing what the, the, the Lord is a giver, a giver, a giver, and the king's going to be a taker, a taker, and taker. But verse 19, the people refuse to listen to Samuel. Now remember, they refuse to listen to Samuel Samuel, who chapter 3, verse 19, none of his words fell to the ground. Surely you can heed somebody when none of, his word, none of his words fall to the ground. But no. Israel will not allow wisdom to lure her away from the folly she so eagerly wants to commit. And here's the real tragedy, verse 22. Samuel is to listen to their voice while they refuse to listen to his See, when the prophet has to listen to the people, 
while all the time the people are not listening to the prophet, then you're in a real pickle. But that is where we find ourselves in the UK now and the church scene. This mirror is picked up again, and Israel's pig-headedness should instruct us. It teaches us, for example, that knowledge or information or truth doesn't itself change or empower. Or knowledge can present the path that lies before us, but that doesn't stop us stubbornly, pig-headedly walking down it. As I was writing this paragraph, I was typing it in my computer, and one of my children entered the study to ask, if they could play on the PlayStation later. And I said, well, I've already told you, you can have half an hour before tea. So I replied that if they came in again and interrupted, then the answer would be no, and they'd lose their half an hour, and that they could play on the PlayStation. Five minutes later, the door creaked open, and a little voice said, can I play on the PlayStation? See, even with the consequences, clearly laid out in front of us, we make the wrong decisions. Pig-headedness, hard hearts. Israel hears God's wisdom, but they won't submit to it. God gives her instruction, but she's unteachable. And why? Because all she's asking for is so plausible, so reasonable, so acceptable, just respectable, so why would the Lord say no? See, it takes the Spirit of God to hammer the Word of God into the thick skull of the people of God so that they won't make dumb decisions that enslave them. 1 Samuel 8 is a, a mirror. It reveals Israel, it reveals Israel's heart. But it's our mirror too. It reveals the church. It reveals you and me more perfectly than we understand. Because even now, many will just reject what has been said because they favor their own thoughts. It reveals how easily we misplace our trust. It reveals how easily we're ashamed to be different. It reveals how resistant we are to a word when it comes to us that doesn't agree with our opinion. I found this um, sticker. It was, uh, well, it's a sticker from a, it was on a mirror in a public um, toilet. Uh, warning, reflections in this mirror may be distorted by socially constructed ideas of beauty. Well, we know, we know what it's getting at. We know what the agenda is. But it just made me think, what if we replaced beauty with the word God, or truth, or morality, or holiness? Reflections in this mirror may be distorted by suchly constructed ideas of morality. See, 1 Samuel 8 is a mirror that reveals where we've been distort distorted by sinful society. But it reveals it in order that we might be restored to beauty. But beauty as is reflected in that great king that we've been singing about this evening, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we pray knowing that you know our hearts better than we know them ourselves. For we are often deceived and deluded. We're so often dumb to the things of Christ. Penetrate through the fog, we pray, gracious Father, to instruct us that we might indeed live in obedience to you and honor you as our king, loving you and recognizing you, the great giver. And in doing so, that the lure of the world will be weakened and its grasp on us. And we pray all this for your glory. Amen.